Good afternoon. I'm Robert Bergino, Chancellor of UC Berkeley. Thank you. And Professor of Physics and Material Science and Engineering. It's my very great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this very special event. I warmly welcome both those who have filled Zellerbach Hall today and the very many others who are watching this event by webcast. Today, we have the distinct honor of welcoming back to, to the Berkeley campus one of our nation's great leaders, the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. His visit to Berkeley in 2002 is still remembered by those who heard him speak as one of the great highlights and most inspiring moments of their campus careers. Most of you, our students who are here today, were pre-teens during his presidency. Nonetheless, within five minutes of the tickets for today's events becoming available to students, they were snapped up by you. Clearly, Bill Clinton's charisma and ability to motivate has extended beyond his presidency to attract and inspire the next generation. President Clinton is a leader by whom I was personally very inspired. His two-term, eight-year administration from 1993 through the year 2000 was marked by achievement as a time of peace and economic well-being for America. The United States enjoyed a strong economy and a period of real social progress. Levels of unemployment, poverty, and crime were low, and college enrollment rates were high. His efforts for health care reform laid the groundwork for President Obama's initiative on this critical issue. His accomplishments include promoting peace and strengthening democracy throughout the world. He showed an unrelenting commitment to equity and inclusion, values we hold very deeply here at Berkeley. Since leaving the White House, President Clinton has dedicated himself to philanthropy and continued public service through the William J. Clinton Foundation. The stated goal of the foundation is strengthening the capacity of people throughout the world to meet the challenges of global interdependence. Most recently, he was invited by President Obama to lead, together with former President George W. Bush, an effort to help the Haitian people reclaim their country and rebuild their lives. He has been working tirelessly. We cannot help but be inspired by his dedication. It is the mission of a great public teaching and research university like Berkeley to serve the public good. We take special pride in public service, which is exemplified by our historically having the greatest number of Peace Corps volunteers. President Clinton's call to global citizenship by turning good intentions into positive actions resonates deeply in our campus DNA. President Clinton has returned to campus at the invitation of the Blum Center for Developing Economies. The Blum Center's goals for serving the poor of the world in a practical way are completely synonymous with the Clinton Foundation's focus on issues that demand urgent action, solutions, and measurable results. The Blum Center was established in March 206, the end result of a conversation which I had with Richard Blum, a Berkeley alumnus, UC regent, and philanthropist, and man deeply committed to alleviating human suffering. Dick's innovative idea, driven by his passion for alleviating poverty in the developing world, was to combine the knowledge and multidisciplinary expertise of our faculty with education and real-life experience for our students in the struggle against global poverty. Our deans and faculty responded enthusiastically. Dick's idea and personal generosity attracted other wonderful supporters, and the center was formed. The interest and eagerness of our students and faculty have been tremendous. Berkeley's commitment to public service, to making an impact on the world, and helping those less fortunate 
has made the Center a remarkable and resounding success. Under the Center's faculty director, S. Shankar Sastry, who is also our Dean of the College of Engineering, the Center spans UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC San Francisco, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. It is educating and inspiring a new generation of global citizens to improve the well-being of the poor in developing countries in practical and engaged ways. We're most grateful to the Blum Center for Developing Economies for giving us this wonderful opportunity today to hear from President Clinton. And it's now my great pleasure to invite to the podium Richard Blum, who will introduce President Clinton. Thank you, Bob, for your kind, thoughtful, and generous remarks. Before I introduce President Clinton, I think many of you know, or may know, that I served as chairman of the Board of Regents at UC for three years. When I became chairman, I was quite outspoken about the need to restructure the university, to downsize its bureaucracy, to make it strategically dynamic in order to advance its academic mission. I was then very surprised to receive in the mail a handwritten note from Bill Clinton that said the following, Dick, I really liked your speech to the California Regents. It is important to make these changes because most of the universities have too much administrative overhead and too little strategic investment. And because what most Americans don't know is that our universities are one area where we still have a great competitive advantage. It is vital to our future. When he spoke of competitive advantage, he was talking about all of you. President Clinton last spoke here on January 29th, 2002. He talked most articulately that day about the challenges of creating a world where people in the poorest countries could strive toward making their lives better through education, innovation, and opportunity. He said that as Americans, we could all help by being good ambassadors and by committing human capital as well as our funds and helping emerging nations grow, prosper, and embrace democratic values and human rights. On that same evening, George Bush gave his State of the Union address, but Bill Clinton here at Berkeley went on to give a State of the World address as eloquently as any speech I've ever heard. I'll probably hear the same today. Uh, President Clinton has certainly proven that he not only walks his talk, he in fact runs it. Since President Clinton was last here, he started the Clinton Global Initiative, which has raised tens of billions of dollars for projects all over the world. Since its inception, CGI has received 1,700 commitments valued at $57 billion and has already impacted 220 million lives in 170 different countries. His CGI meetings in September in New York each year bring people from all over the world together who are committed to solving, as we are, the surrounding poverty, health care, and environmental and human rights issues. Some say the Clinton Global Initiative is a little bit like Davos. I think it's different. The CGI is not a think tank, it's an action machine. We are all aware that President Clinton and President George H.W. Bush tirelessly brought about help to the victims of the tsunami in the Indian Ocean. He has worked on Hurricane Katrina issues and President Clinton is currently the UN Special Envoy to help Haiti in the aftermath of the earthquake and I think uh, despite not feeling perfectly well has been down there two times since it's happened. We at Berkeley have been up and running for three years, making great progress at the Blum Center for Developing Economies. 
Thanks to many of you, 2,500 students have been through our classes. 220 Berkeley kids went to 38 countries last summer, and we are finding ways to work with the Clinton Global Initiative. I just returned from Ghana and Sudan. I was in Darfur last week. Our Darfur stoves burn one-third as much wood as the traditional ones do, and the women, therefore, don't have to leave the villages to seek something to burn and be at risk. Our ultraviolet water filters are now bringing literally clean water to hundreds of thousands of people in Asia and Africa, particularly India. Mr. President, we hope we can become your West Coast cousins. <laughs> of all the relationships my wife, Diane Feinstein, and I have in Washington over the last 17 years, there are no two people that we admire more than Bill and Hillary Clinton, a great Secretary of State, I might add. I would now like to introduce my good friend, the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, first, to my good friend Dick Blum for the introduction and the great work that the Blum Center does to improve the lives of people who live on less than $2 a day all over the world, about half the world's population. Uh, I thank Chancellor Bergenau for welcoming me back to Berkeley. I'm glad to be here. I was shocked to be reminded that it was eight years ago <laughs> that I last spoke on this stage. You will find that as you get older, the years fly faster, and you remember things that you did with absolute clarity. It's just that you can't remember the year in which you did them. <laughs> but I'm glad to be back. I remember well that day eight years ago. I tried to speak about what I thought the nature of the 21st century world was and what the challenges facing America were. Uh, today, I want to build on that, I repeat very briefly some of the points I made then, but updated to this new decade. The Blum Center and the work it does around the world, the work my foundation does in America and around the world, reflect two of the most hopeful developments of the early 21st century. First is the rise of what I would call communitarianism not necessarily a more left-wing philosophy, but a more embracing one, the idea that we are in an interdependent world and we will either make a community of shared opportunities and shared responsibilities or we will pay the price because we're interdependent. Divorce is not an option. What we do affects others. What others do affects us. There is a deeper understanding of this, I think, than ever before not just in places with the level of diversity you can see if you look around this crowd, but in every nook and cranny of our country. Accompanying that has been the rise of non-governmental organizations. And NGOs are groups that do all different kinds of things, but America has a million of them, not counting the 355,000 religious institutions from all faiths that do community-based work. They are an old tradition in America, and I'll say more that, about that in a moment. But it is fascinating that we do. Now you see them everywhere. India has a million, more than a million now, NGOs working in India. About half of them 
Indian-based, half of them international. China has a few hundred thousand. Russia, notwithstanding the opposition of the government, has a couple of hundred thousand. There are fabulous NGOs mostly concentrating in microcredit and the rest of the Indian subcontinent, especially in Bangladesh. You see them in Southeast Asia. You see them in Africa. You see them in Latin America. This explosion of non-governmental activity. And I think that on balance, this is a very, very good thing. But I do not want to imply by extolling the virtues of non-governmental citizen action that I think governments and policies of governments are not important. I'll come back to that in a moment. But let's just begin with where we are. We live in an interdependent world. We need a communitarian mentality. We need more non-governmental action because this world, for all of its joys, and there are lots of them, the increasing diversity, the increasing way of communicating the, because of the internet, the increasing way of getting information in a nanosecond, all the advances. This is a pretty interesting time to be alive. When I was elected back in 1993, which hardly qualifies as the dark ages, <laughs> uh, when I took office, there were a grand total of 50 5.0 sites on the World Wide Web. There have been more than that added since I've been talking. <laughs> the day I took the oath of office, the average cell phone weighed five pounds. <laughs> now I have to get one of the wider models for my big hands, and I still misdial about one in every three numbers. There's a lot of great stuff going on here, but there are three really profound problems with the modern world that are persistent, that have to be met with a communitarian response. The first is that the world is entirely too unequal, both between rich and poor countries and within countries. Half the world's people live on less than two bucks a day. A billion people live on less than a dollar a day. 75% of the people in Haiti where I'm working now live on less than $2 a day, lived on it before the earthquake. A billion people never have access to clean water. Two and a half billion people have no access to sanitation. Think of all the things you take for granted here. You would be shocked if the air control system malfunctioned, if all the lights went out and we couldn't see each other, or if the sound system failed and you couldn't hear anything. I spend most of my time now working in places where people can't take any of this for granted because of the inequality of opportunity. And it has enormous consequences. The number one public health problem we have in Haiti today, after the immediate emergency is over and people were performing amputations in the middle of the night with vodka and hacksaws and there were no supplies, the number one problem we have now is sanitation because everybody's moved somewhere else, living in makeshift settlements. And I learned much to my distress when I started trying to help after the earthquake, even though I'd been working in Haiti a year before then, that none of the people who make latrines in the world, including compost toilets, ever developed any residual production capacity to account for a natural disaster. I learned that a lot of the most gifted NGOs in the world think they know how to dig big latrines and don't. I learned all kinds of things because of the gap between rich and poor. We think we know what other people need sometimes and we don't. This is unsustainable. You see it in healthcare. One fourth of all the deaths on planet Earth last year including those from natural disasters, from wars, from traditional heart uh, disease and cancers, from violence and accidents, one quarter of all deaths were from AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and diseases related to dirty water, cholera, dysentery, diarrhea. 80% of the deaths in that last category are children under five. 
which should tell you why I'm worried about the sanitation conditions in Haiti. Little children walking in makeshift settlements with one cut on their feet stepping in the wrong puddle of water could lead to an unbelievably dire consequences. By and large, these diseases are the diseases of the poor. You may know someone who will die of AIDS, but that's because they're among the few for whom medicine doesn't work anymore in America or because they get off their treatment regime. By and large, these are the diseases of the poor and a manifestation of global inequality. We're trying to get the schools back up in Haiti again. 130 million people never go to school at all. And at least that many do go to schools, but they do so nominally. That is, their teachers aren't trained and they have no access to learning materials. Yet we know in the poorest countries, just one year of schooling adds 10% per year to earning capacity for life. And it's something to think about when, and I'll say more about this in a minute, but here you are in, at, in the crown jewel of the finest system of public higher education ever developed by anybody anywhere under assault because of the economic conditions of our time. But you think about how many people there are who were born with the same mental capacity you do that never even got to, you have, that never even got to spend a day in school. So the world is entirely too unequal. The second problem the world has is it is highly unstable. The interdependence mean, among other things, that not only that divorce is not an option, but that borders don't count for as much anymore. And it's great if you're sending something over the internet, unless it's how to make a bomb. Look at the interdependence as manifested by the financial crisis. It begins in the United States. Then all of a sudden people think, well, maybe we should look at our bank books. Turns out in the UK and in in Ireland, they're more leveraged than we are, so it spreads there. Then these little pension funds in small English towns start failing. Turns out it's because they all invested in Iceland in financial instruments that promised even higher rates of return than were being promised by the highly leveraged, highly leveraged institutions in the UK, Ireland, and the US. So Iceland collapses, the whole government is wiped out, and the reputation of that wonderful little place was badly damaged even though before this happened, it was largely known as the European country that had produced the largest number of self largest percentage of self-made millionaires of any European country, not through finance, but through starting by and large information technology and marketing enterprises. Then China, which had more money than it knew what to do with because we bought so much stuff from them, but had no financial crisis, all of a sudden winds up with 35 million unemployed workers because we and the Europeans don't buy so much of their production anymore. That is a manifestation of interdependence just as much as any kind of pen pal you have halfway around the world is. Before 9-11, the Al-Qaeda proves itself of conduct, able to conduct operations in Tanzania and Kenya, where most of its victims were Africans, even though the targets were American embassies, to blow up a ship in Yemen, then to mount operations in Spain, in the United Kingdom, in Bali, in Indonesia. And that's why, whether you agree with it or not, there's been such an emphasis on sending the drones into the borderless area between Afghanistan and Pakistan to try to constrain the instability of a clever adversary proved, which has proved itself over and over again, able to inspire people, to organize them, and to use information technology to conduct operations a long way from the base. So it's a highly unstable world. And finally, it's unsustainable because of the way we produce and consume energy. And we are all dependent or affecting each other in that pattern. For example, the United States and China are the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, but Australia is the first place to be truly hit hard by climate change. You can see it in the dramatic increase in wildfires and their reduced ability to grow crops and feed livestock 
in all kinds of other areas. And a few months ago, a study came out saying that most cruelly, the next group of countries to be hard hit by climate change are the poorest countries that are making the smallest contribution to it, the equatorial African countries, places like Afghanistan and Haiti. So that, too, is a form of interdependence. And I take it, I don't have to make the case here that notwithstanding the new energy given by the deniers of climate change, the fundamental settled science has not changed. And if somebody steals an email, a few emails out of the University of East Anglia and commits a crime, if they had been trying to prove that climate change was real, the same crowd that's extolling this theft would be asking that they put, be put in jail. But they steal the, the emails and doctor them up a little bit and make it look like this is a case that climate change doesn't exist. A relatively minor mistake is made by the International Panel on Climate Change by the United Nations, but it's a glaring one, acting as if there is a fixed date at which we will know the Himalayan glacier will melt, and all of a sudden people say, oh, it's not real, as if the Himalayan glaciers weren't melting. Oh, it's not 2035, it's 2039. Let's go back to sleep. So I personally believe that, and I want to say more about that in a minute, hold that thought, because I think that one of the problems with the way information is communicated in the modern world is if we're not careful, we all start majoring in the minors when we should be majoring in the majors. I don't think anything that I have seen or read has called into serious question the fact that the 10 hottest years on record have all occurred since 1995. I noticed one of the uh, climate change opponents in the Senate the other day said, obviously this whole global warming thing was a hoax because they had a record snow in Washington. <laughs> I think our friends in China and India and elsewhere would tell us that you cannot extrapolate from what is happening in Washington, D.C., a general rule for the world. <laughs> you can't even extrapolate a general rule for America. And we have had a real cold February. But January was the warmest January ever recorded. They always kind of forget. They sort of leave that out. And while we were worried about how cold Washington, D.C. was, when the Olympics opened in Vancouver, if you'll remember, in the first week, one of the big problems was they didn't have enough snow and it was too slushy and they were worried that some of the events would be dangerous because their weather was too warm. I just, so I want you to keep that framework in mind. The world's pretty great or you wouldn't be sitting here today for a lot of us, but it is far too unequal, too unstable, and too unsustainable for this pattern to continue throughout your lifetime. Therefore, the major job you will have is to build up the positive and reduce the negative forces of interdependence. If you ask me what my position is on anything, I may not give you the correct answer, but I'm sure I have the correct filter. That is, whatever your question is, my mind will immediately go to the following question. Will this build up the positive or reduce the negative forces of interdependence? If it will, I'm for it. If it won't, I'm against it. And I spend my life now trying to think about that. So that's the first point. Now, what is the role of the private citizen, the university student, in building the positive and reducing the negative forces of interdependence. I believe it is to participate in some way according to your interest, ability, and capacity in the non-governmental revolution sweeping the world. I already said America had a million NGOs here. This tradition in America of citizen organizations is actually older than our country. Benjamin Franklin organized the first volunteer fire department in the United States before the Constitution was ratified. And he did it in our founding city, Philadelphia. 
When de Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, he observed in the early 19th century that the difference in the U.S. and what the previous administration disparagingly referred to as old Europe, I kind of like old Europe myself, but anyway, he said the difference is at that time, if the government had not met some need in Europe, people would complain about it and just com keep complaining about it until the government either did something or didn't. In America, he said, they tend to complain about it a day or two, and then they just go home and organize and fix the problem. Now, I like that, but it shouldn't be a, a virtue that you apply so broadly as to say government doesn't matter. I want to come back to that. But the point is, we've always been into doing for ourselves with each other. And it's now become a global phenomenon. And I just recently, I told you at the outset of the talk how this whole non-governmental movement is sweeping the world. One of the biggest challenges we have in Haiti is how to coordinate all the NGOs that are there now so that we at least meet certain standards for public health and good education and dealing with all the great things that they're trying to do and that to whatever extent we can, we harmonize their work with the World Food Program and UNICEF and all these multinational agencies as well as the work that the United States and others are doing. But this is exploding across the world. In my foundation, we now sell the world's least expensive AIDS medicine in 70 countries. And we work on building healthcare systems in about 30. And we have economic projects in Latin America and Africa and in the United States. We have healthcare projects in America, the most important of which is a campaign against childhood obesity, which the First Lady Michelle Obama has just taken on, and I applaud her for that. And I just left Los Angeles where uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and I and a number of other people from schools all over California talked about what is being done on that. That's the number one public health problem in America. And that should tell you something about rich and poor. In America, our biggest public health problem is childhood obesity. In earthquake ravaged Haiti, their biggest public health problem is basic sanitation. And that illustrates a point I will come back to, but I might as well make it now. In poor countries, the biggest problem is lack of capacity. People are just as smart as we are. They work hard. Sometimes they work harder just to keep body and soul together. They don't have the organized structures that we take for granted that give predictability to our lives and make a connection between the ability we have and the effort we exert and the result we get. Therefore, life is so chaotic, it's almost impossible to build a harmonious, coherent society in which everybody has a chance to live their dreams and develop their abilities and you're continuously taking down the forces of inequality and instability. In rich countries, the problem is just the reverse. There's great capacity and enormous strength in institutions, otherwise we could not have risen to the point we are, not just the US, anywhere. The problem in wealthy countries is rigidity, where institutions have grown so used to their position in society, their power, their influence, their wealth, that they resist making the changes necessary to allow them to pursue the thing they were set up to do in the first place. So we have rigidity problems which have affected our economic system, our financial regulation system, our healthcare system, our education system, and the way we produce and consume energy. And governance in general. So when you think about these things and building the positive and reducing the negative forces, I think it will help when you analyze America if you say, is this a rigidity problem? Why are we resisting change here? You don't have to demonize the institutions against change. For they did something good in the past, otherwise we wouldn't be where we are, but they've lost the capacity to change. They'd rather preserve their piece of the present pie than pursue the purposes for which they were established in the first place. This is, I would remind you, 
a, a tendency as old as government itself. But it is a profound challenge in America today, complicated by human psychology. In the 15th century, Niccolo Machiavelli said there is nothing so difficult in all of human affairs as to change the established order of things. Now, I'll revert to colloquial in English to finish the quote. He didn't exactly say it like this, but this is the point he made. He said, the reason that is so is that when any change is proposed, those who will lose are certain of their loss, while those who will gain are uncertain of their advantage. And you saw it all play out in this healthcare thing. So we have rigidity problems. Haiti, they got capacity problems. In Africa, capacity problems. In all four countries, capacity problems. In both areas, citizens can make a difference working through non-governmental organizations, as well as advocating the right kind of public policy changes. So just for example, I'll just give you a couple of examples in terms of what we try to do. When I started working in this AIDS area, there was not very much money being spent on AIDS medicine. President Bush's PEPFAR program had not been stood up. The Global Fund on AIDS, TB, and Malaria had not been funded. And we were charging $10,000 a year to the American taxpayers for AIDS medicine for poor people on Medicaid who got it or people who are otherwise Medicaid eligible. Generic drugs were only $500 a year, produced largely in India and South Africa. Now that sounds cheap, but if you live in a country with a per capita income of under a dollar a day, that's still a lot of money. If your government doesn't have the capacity to raise revenues brought from a broad spectrum of its earners, that's a lot of money. So when we looked at it, this is something that a non-governmental group can do that a governmental group wouldn't normally do. We found out that even at $500 a, a dosage a year, this business was run on the following model. Low volume, uncertain payment, because these countries didn't have a lot of money, therefore high profit margin, so they could stay in business. So we took a different proposal to them. This is what a non-governmental organization can do. We said, hey, how about changing your business model? We have beginning with Ireland and Canada, countries that will give you money to buy this medicine, or will give poor countries money. So we asked the manufacturers in India and South Africa, we said, how about changing your business model from low volume to high volume, from uncertain payment to certain payment, and therefore from high profit margins to low profit margins? In other words, stop running the AIDS drugs business as if it were a small town jewelry store and start running it as if it were a huge grocery store. That's all we did. But the price went from $500 a person a year to 149 to 120. The children's age drugs went from $600 a year down to 120, down to 90, down to 60. And half of all the people in the world who get medicine now in four countries get it off these contracts. Two thirds of all the children who get medicines get it off this contract. That's something a non-governmental organization can do to figure out how to do something faster, cheaper, better. We try to do that in the way we do building retrofits to fight climate change and whether we can amass, work out the financing so we can do large solar thermal projects that will help to offset the effects of climate change and still give poor people and people in rich countries a source of clean power. We've tried to do that in fighting childhood obesity, negotiating uh, with soft drink companies, for example, to reduce the caloric content of vending machine drinks in schools by 58%. We found if we could get them all to do it, that they'd all jump off together. Now 80% of the schools in America are doing that. So that's one of the things a non-governmental organization can do. And it represents the traditional role of the NGO to this extent. All these non-governmental groups started the same way the Volunteer Fire Department in Philadelphia started. Because 
in any given moment in history, even if time comes when the economy's rocking along and everyone you vote for wins, and they do everything you think they ought to do, there will always be some gaps in the social fabric, some gaps between what the private economy will produce and the government can provide. And historically, the, the role of non-governmental groups has been to fill that space. Now, in addition to that, however, there are other things being done today. Innovation, the AIDS drug example, and integration. What I never ask people to lose money who work with me. I ask them to make money in a different way. That's what the AIDS manufacturers did. And I don't go to a country unless the government asks me in with the understanding that we have a 100% no corruption policy. If I catch anybody stealing money and having kids die, we're, we're out of there. So as a result, we're building government capacity and helping the private sector to make money in a more socially beneficial way rather than a less beneficial way. All these things can be done. And now, the most important thing I can say is everybody can do this. Look at what happened after the Haiti earthquake occurred. First, you had uh, George Clooney and others putting together this amazing concert, Hope for Haiti, in no time. They put it together in a week, and it raised $66 million. A lot of it in $10 pops because you could text Haiti into your phone and one number, and automatically $10 would be transferred here or five bucks in Canada. Amazing. Most of the rest of the money was given over the internet. So very few people gave $100,000 or more in that $66 million figure. Most people gave $100 or less. And these massive amounts of money were given by people who wanted to make a difference. By the same token, you have people who are able to give some time. All of a sudden, I had Teams of doctors from New York, where I live, calling me saying, I can only stay five days, but send me down there. And a group of two or three who were particular friends of mine and work with uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, who runs Partners in Health and is my UN deputy, a lot of you know who he is. They were down there and they called me back and said, here are 36 antibiotics and other medicines we need. And by the way, get us some standing lamps, even if you have to go to Walmart to get them, and bring me a generator to run them so we can operate 24 hours a day. Otherwise, babies are gonna die in throes because of infections, sepsis. So I did it. All non-governmental groups. And what I wanna say to you is that there's something all of you can do in this way. Whatever your politics, whatever else is going on, I'll give you just a couple of examples. Dick talked about the Clinton Global Initiative. It is true, every year at the opening of the UN, we have a two and a half day meeting where we invite philanthropists, business people, non-governmental organizations, and the world leaders that show up for the UN. And we talked about, we talk about how to meet the major challenges facing the world. No one gets to give a speech except the Secretary General of the UN, or the President of the United States if they show up and they can't talk more than 10 minutes. <laughs> Everything else is a conversation focused on what I believe to be the most important question facing the 21st century world. Most of the time I was in politics, we debated three things. What are you gonna do? Who's gonna do it, public or private sector? How much money are you gonna spend on it? What we do at the Global Initiative is focus on the fourth question. However much money you have, whatever it is you propose to do, how are you going to do it so that you turn your good intentions into positive changes? In other words, in the climate change area, what's the analog of what we did with AIDS drugs? In the health area, what's the analog in setting up healthcare systems? Oh, how can you use technology to democratize education and get the 100 plus million people who aren't in school the level of learning they need to function 
and to grow their countries. How? The how question, I think, may well turn out to be the most important question in the 21st century. And if you're in the non-governmental area, what you're always trying to do is to answer the how question in a way that puts yourself out of business because then the government changes its policy and the private sector does what it can do. And then you go on to another challenge. That's how I see what I am doing. And the Global Initiative has literally raised 10-year commitments worth over $55 billion, and already more than 220 million people have been helped. So a couple of years ago, we decided that we ought to do one just for university students. And we had the first one in Tulane in New Orleans because it was the site of Katrina, and it was beginning to come back, and because we wanted to highlight what could be done to bring it back. Last year, we met at the University of Texas at Austin. And we, always, we have increasing numbers of young people come from other countries. 14 young students came all the way from China last year. And we always do a community service project. If you go to New Orleans now in the Lower Ninth Ward, there are a set of houses that are greenhouses, extremely energy efficient and hurricane and flood resistant, built by Brad Pitt's foundation, Make It Right on a plot of land that was cleared by our students at our CGI University meeting. So last year we were in East Austin in a, a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood working at a community center and I was going around shaking hands with the students and I asked this young man where he was from and he said, I'm from Myanmar, I'm from Burma. And you probably know we don't have many relations with them. And I said, how in the living daylights did you get here? <laughs> he said, you invited me. <laughs> and I said, from Burma? He said, no, I was in school in London. And I said, well, did we help you come? Because we give 40% of the students we help pay their way. He said, nope, I raised the money myself. And I said, so you go from Burma to London and you're standing in a Hispanic community center in Austin, Texas. Why did you do this? He said, because my country's got a lot of trouble, and I know it, but you're not going to fix it. People like me have to fix it, and this is one way we'll fix it, by proving we can help real people and make the government work for people instead of for the people that are in power. It was an amazing encounter. About 50 students from Berkeley have come to one of these two meetings, and they made some fascinating commitments. Everybody has to make a commitment at the college meetings, just like at the regular CGI. A pilot program for student vegetable gardens in California's public schools. A health worker training program in a poor region of Honduras. And several others. Every student that's come from Berkeley has made an interesting commitment. And together they have made a real difference. So the next one's in April at the University of Miami. And it's April 16th to 18th. There will be a lot of focus there on Haiti, if you're interested in, and we're still taking applications. So if you want to come, you can apply between now and March 1st. You've got another week to apply. I would urge you to do that. If you don't want to come, we webcast this. I would urge you to follow it over the internet. And one of the things we've done is to raise money from companies, including Walmart or the Pat Tillman Foundation. You all know who Pat Tillman was? the professional football player who was killed by friendly fire in Iraq. His, his wife is a re remarkable woman who's opened a foundation and raised money to try to help young people who are survivors, who are not going to be killed in war, to make more of their lives. That's the way she thinks she can best honor her husband's life. And so she and several others have given us the money to help fund student projects. So this year, because there's a limit to the number of students who can actually physically come to Miami, if you don't want to come or you can't come, you can follow it on the internet and also apply for support for some project you have, even if you're not physically present at the Clinton Global Initiative University meeting. The website is cgiu.org, and I would urge you to Check it out.
Now let me just say a word about politics. Politics are important, but not an excuse not to do this kind of work. Because remember what I said, even if there comes a day when everybody you vote for wins and the economy is humming along again and they, the people in office do everything you want them to do, there will still be gaps in the social fabric that have to be filled by citizens. And we have more power to do that than ever before, partly because of the internet and partly because of information sharing and networking, which enables us to empower other people to do what they want to do. I really believe, in spite of this horrible earthquake, that the people of Haiti, where Hillary and I have been going since 1975, have the best chance in my lifetime, and perhaps in their 206-year history, since they became the first and to date the only successful nation established by a slave revolt, to escape the darker parts of their heritage. And I really believe that America has a chance, in spite of the frustrations of the moment, 50 years from now, to still be the world's leading force for peace and prosperity and social justice. But we have to change. And the one thing I would say to you, we don't have time to go through all these policy differences, but you're at a university, we got to stop majoring in the minors. You look at this healthcare debate is bewildering to me. And part of it is the way news is disseminated today, you know. You see a big headline today, one of the major networks has got to cut their whole news staff 25% because old guys like me don't watch the evening news anymore, we just turn on the movies and the sports. Really, I mean, and because there's a great sorting going on in America as we have more and more choices uh, over satellite television and over the internet. We don't have to read newspapers. With Kindles, we may never have to read another book. We can read 25 blog sites every day that agree with us. And there is a great tendency among those that are left viewing only to look at what agrees with us. There's a fascinating book, by the way, written by a liberal Democrat named Bill Bishop called The Big Sort. He lived in a neighborhood uh, that voted for John Kerry more than four to one over President Bush in Austin, Texas. But the neighborhood lost its only Republican, who then moved to a neighborhood that voted for Bush five to one over Kerry. And it got into thinking about how people were being sorted out. That's happening to all of us. We tend to cluster and listen to and learn from people that agree with us. And it tends to create these really churning sites like on television where people are trying to keep us in upset all the time. And news is delivered in a way designed to increase the likelihood that you will have attention deficit disorder. <laughs> and the problem is that makes you vulnerable to majoring in the minors and minoring in the majors. I can tell you in my long life, going way beyond politics, anytime I made a very important decision, when I was frustrated or angry or scared, there was about a 75% chance I'd make a mistake. And particularly a lot of these, these cable channels, they're trying to keep us frustrated, angry, or scared all the time. And so I think it's quite important that we get back to the basics. In healthcare, the basic fact is this. We're spending 17.2% of our income on healthcare. Nobody else in a rich country spends more than 11 and a half. That's Switzerland, where the delivery system is more expensive because so many people are in alpine villages, and the country is even older than we are. Canada spends 10 and a half. All other countries, including the two consistently most highly rated France and Germany spend 10. The difference in 10% of GDP and 17.2 is approximately $1 trillion. So what do we get for the $1 trillion? That is, if we adopted their systems, we'd save a trillion dollars. 
What do we get from that? Now you think about what Berkeley's budget needs. Think about what's happened to tuition at California's universities. Think about what happened when the kids that are coming out of the two-year system don't automatically get into one of the Cal State schools anymore. Think about everything that's happened here, okay? So our first priority was to write a check for a trillion dollars for a system that is 39th in infant mortality and 42nd in adult life expectancy and never ranks better than 35th in overall end products of health care. And even if you make allowances for how many poor people we have, how many first-generation immigrants, there is no way you can make this look pretty. We insure 84% of our people, everybody else insures 100. And that understates the problem. At any, some point during every year, 30% of the American people will, will be without health insurance coverage. And we seem to think we have nothing to learn from anyone else. And the people that are trying to keep us torn up are really shameless. I saw one guy wrote an article after I had my little stint put in last week. He said, boy, I bet Bill Clinton's glad his health care plan failed. I bet he's glad President Obama's health care plan failed. Otherwise, he'd be dead. Needless to say, our friends in the United Kingdom and France and Germany were appalled. Like, and it's, see, it's designed to keep you upset. You, forget about the public interest. You might have to give something up if, God forbid, we save the American economy and had a competitive and actually better health care system. We got to get over that. And we need to get this done. I'm just telling you, I cannot see a scenario where the United States will be able to maintain its higher education system and, its pub and improve its public education system and diversify its economy if we keep writing a hot check for a trillion dollars to our competitors at the start of every year to keep ourselves sicker. So we need to think. Same thing's true in education. I'll tell you an interesting thing about American higher education. I wouldn't have become president if I hadn't had a chance to go to college, go to law school, get a loan, a government-backed loan, <laughs> and pay it back <laughs> with honor. I wouldn't. From the end of World War II until 2001, until I left office, through Republican and Democrat administrations alike, through good and bad economies alike, the United States always ranked first in the world in one category. The percentage of our young adults with four-year college degrees. We were always first. In one decade, we fell to 10th. Now, part of that, to be fair, is a lot of our competitors saw what it did for us, and they started sending more kids to school in their own countries. And more power to them. You should never want anybody else to be poor. Never begrudge another nation's success. You should want them to be more successful. No way in the world a country with only 330 million people can be the only economic, political, and military superpower throughout the 21st century, the way we were briefly at the end of the Cold War. But we should be a leading force, and we should be a beacon of opportunity and change. And we allowed this to happen in part because our delivery system got whacked out. After inflation, college costs went up 75% in the last decade, while median income after inflation declined $2,000. We could have handled the increase in cost if people's incomes had been gone up and going up, and we'd created more jobs. It doesn't serve any purpose to deny these facts. We have to figure out what should be done about the economic delivery system and the education delivery system. There are 100 countries that are more energy efficient than we are. Look, I'm all for solar and wind and geothermal and all of that. But America needs jobs today. You get 870 jobs for every billion dollars you put into coal plants. You put it into a nuclear plant, you can get 1,000 to 1,500. You put it into solar power, you get 1,900. You put it into wind, if you make and assemble the windmills where you put them up, you get 3,300 jobs. Every billion dollars you spend retrofitting buildings gets you 7,000 jobs. Unemployment in the construction industry is 17%. 
Why are we pretending that it is the end of economic life on our planet if we change the way we produce and consume energy? The truth is, it's the number one ticket to a prosperous, broad-based economy in America and throughout the world in the 21st century. Why did nobody say? In Copenhagen, I noticed nobody said, and all the people who were telling us how terrible it was and who were doing handstands when nobody signed an agreement in Copenhagen, everybody forgot to point out some inconvenient facts. Forget now about climate change. Just be nakedly selfish. <laughs> when Al Gore and I finished the Kyoto Treaty, we helped to finish it, and he went to Japan and actually closed the deal. We had no support in the Congress for doing something about climate change. It is the only bill I ever lost in the Congress before I sent it to them. The Senate voted 98 to nothing against Kyoto before Al got off the airplane, <laughs> coming home. Why? Because then there was no consensus that climate change was real, and people believed that there was no way we could get rich or stay, get richer or even keep our standard of living. We didn't keep spewing more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, we know better now. Kyoto, of the countries that signed it, the 44 wealthiest were required to reduce their greenhouse gases by very specific targets by 2012, okay? Today, we can only be sure that four countries will do it. What are they? Denmark, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and Germany. We know they will meet their Kyoto targets. Now, before the economic meltdown, which began on September 15, 2008, all four of those countries had lower unemployment rates than we did, higher growth rates than we did, less income inequality than we have because of the dramatic increase in the number of jobs and new businesses spawned by making a commitment to change the way they produce and consume energy. Now, the UK was hurt very badly because for other reasons they were more leveraged and even less well-regulated than we were financially. But even today, Denmark, Sweden, and Germany have considerably lower unemployment rates than we do. Deutsche Bank recently did a study on the impact of Germany's solar policies. Now, this is not Greenpeace. This is Deutsche Bank. <laughs> okay? They said, even making allowances for the cost of the subsidies to make Germany the number one user of solar power in the world, when average sunlight in the whole country is the same as it is in London, England, they had netted 300,000 new jobs, which if we just had a per capita extrapolation to America would be 1.2 million from solar alone. But last year, there was a scientific survey published which assessed the relative capacity of various countries to accommodate a transition to solar and to wind. The United States ranked first in solar capacity and third in wind capacity. So we need to have the right sorts of debates. But meanwhile, the, what I'm pleading with you today is therefore don't give up your citizenship. Don't give up advocating, don't give up working, and for God's sakes, don't give up voting. That's the biggest pattern in the last three elections and the two governorships and the Senate race in Massachusetts has not been party differences in voting, it's been drop off of young people. Don't do that, but just realize that one of the best ways to change other people's minds is to demonstrate with something they can see that what you are for works that you have, you have answered the how question. That the fear that we can't change the way we produce and consume energy without wrecking the economy can best be answered by a physical manifestation that proves it's not so. That the fear that we can't change healthcare without somehow taking wonderful treatments away from people like me who want to live forever is to demonstrate it's not so. That the fear that you can't help poor people because there's just something wrong they don't have it can best be refuted by demonstrating that it is not 
so in Haiti and Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia, anywhere. And so for all of your frustrations, and I have to tell you, you're living at the time in human history when the individual citizen, if he or she is a genuine communitarian that is willing to make common cause with like-minded people and willing to look at the facts and not to major in the minors, can have more influence over the outcome of affairs than ever before. The future is in your hands. You gotta be able to answer the how question and you have to be willing to put yourselves on the line. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. What can I say? I'm corruptible. I love having this. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you. And I will wear them both with pride and given how cold it is at home, in need. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks.